to everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, meeting of the Global Clinical Engineering Alliance on behalf of GCEA. It's really my pleasure to uh, introduce a new format that the Alliance is introducing uh, within its uh, educational activities. Uh, we've called this uh, talk series and it's a, a short uh, appointment that we are going to repeat across the months, uh, discussing with the experts about specific topics in a more concise way as compared to the webinars or the training courses. Uh, today, I have the pleasure and honor to introduce the first of these talks. And the title of the talk is Why My Next Career Step is Forensic Engineering. And the speaker is Dr. Yadin David. Uh, Yadin doesn't need a really big introduction because I guess that most of you uh, know him. However, it's really my pleasure to just give you some elements of his bio and expertise in this specific field of the talk of today. So Dr. Da David uh, is one of the most relevant uh, clinical engineers uh, in the global uh, scenario, and he served in the US as the founder and first president of the American College of Clinical Engineering and of the nonprofit Healthcare Technology Foundation. Uh, Dr. David served on the board of uh, the Clinical Engineering Division uh, of uh, IFMB, and he has also been and still is a technical advisor to the World Health Organization. Currently, he is editor-in-chief of uh, the Global Clinical Engineering Journal and very relevant for today is an interim president of the Global Clinical Engineering Alliance. Uh, Yadin also served as chairman and member of the FDA advisory panels. Uh, I would like to mention uh, and this is very specific to his expertise in the topic of today, that uh, Dr. Yadin is a board certified in forensic engineering and a fellow of the National Academy of Forensic Engineering. So we think that we are touching a very relevant topic today, forensic engineering, and we have really one of the global experts in the matter. So I will not uh, go any farther and really with a big pleasure, leave the stage to Dr. Yadin David. And uh, uh, I wish uh, all the attendants of this uh, talk series appointment uh, to have a very good uh, learning experience today. Thank you and Dr. Yadin, the stage is yours. Thank you, Stefano, for the very kind words. I am uh, happy to be part of this new talk series and honored to deliver the first presentation. I think it's very appropriate for the field of clinical engineering to better understand what forensic engineering is all about because it requires expertise, uh, experience, communication skills, and compassion to have an impact, to make a difference. And therefore, it might be very appropriate next step for senior clinical engineers and those who are practicing in the field to look into what is forensic engineering. And that's what I'm planning to do today, to give you the background, why we have uh, forensic engineering needs, what it is, what the method methodology, and how you go about to qualify and practice it. So let's go. You know, the world is not an ideal environment. In this world, we are doing many things, many activity. And as we walk around the different corners of the planet, there are hazards every place. Hazards that might be having a little amount of risk or maybe significant amount of risk. And therefore, they are con co contributing to unintended outcomes. In healthcare, we call it adverse events. Those adverse events are not safe and can cause harm and damage to property. And we would like to minimize that as much as possible. But because in this world, we have many areas, including patient safety that need to have better um, uh, control and have better risk management programs, part of the field is forensic engineering. How can we learn what is not safe 
Can we predict, predict those conditions? And if we can, can we educate the uh, field to prevent them and have a, a real time measurement of risk exposure in our facility? Think about it. Like you can hear the noise of the stretchers and the food carts that are moving in the hallways, all the alarms that sounding in patient rooms that disturb us a lot and the patient are not happy. But then there might be another indicator, another alarm that is suggesting that patient safety require immediate intervention because the trend is not going in the right direction. So not only we understand that we want to prevent unintended outcomes because of failures, but also because of errors in areas like medication delivery, which might be the wrong drug delivered in the wrong uh, path, uh, delivered by uh, wrong dose, and by infusion pump that is not well calibrated and maintained. All this is part of a culture, part of a team a collaboration that focusing on how can we make it safer and functioning between our systems, processes, and technology much, much better. So this is what this presentation about. I will give you a short background about the healthcare delivery trends. Um, we'll make the point that healthcare is local, absolutely, but the technology is global. What is the scope and uh, purpose of forensic engineering? How do you apply skills to that? What are the methodology to conduct uh, the practice of forensic engineering? If we'll have time, we'll visit some case study um, that I have in my armament. I probably was involved in over 400 investigation. And the last question, the last point in the outline is make the the conclusion, is it all worth it? Albert Einstein says that we ha are having an ongoing significant problem that not always we can solve at the same level of thinking that we were when we created them. Very interesting idea because it does fit the forensic engineering environment. We have to pull back and realize that the dependency of healthcare services on technology for delivering of its services is extremely high. It is higher today, this dependency on technology than it was yesterday. And the trend suggesting that tomorrow, this dependency is gonna be even higher with the introduction of further digital health, robotics, uh, image support, surgery intervention, and so on. The environment where care is delivery is also changing from hospitals that, was, that were the conventional point of care, we're now seeing assisted living, home care, on the job care and uh, remote care that are going to be part uh, more and more of our daily routine. And clinical engineers are already seeing that and understand that those challenges are increasing the, our ability to manage and control the risk of technology. We are having a capacity issue. A study that was published recently is showing that in the North America alone, in US, during the COVID-19 era, over 100,000 nurses left the practice because of stress, fatigue, and mental pressures. Yet, we have more patients within the system, the jobs did not go away, and the rest of the nurses are required to take the burden. Therefore, they are experiencing a shortage, fatigue, and stress, and not enough time to be trained on these new technologies that are still coming in to their point of care. That raised the issue of who is competent to integrate and manage those systems, those complex environments, and how can we ensure that the mandate for the public to have quality outcome, the Hippocrates pledge of do no harm and to improve efficiency all are met. Therefore, we, may, we need to see that we exchange lessons learned and evidence discovered much better 
so we can have a life cycle technology management that is meaningful. Medical device market is not small portion of the commercial world. It is significantly large. And as we talked, it is continuously growing. They are suggesting that in 2025, the trend will give us over 600 billion US dollar in US alone. US is about um, 45, 48% of the market of medical technology. The rest, uh, one additional one third is in Europe. And then uh, in Asia is the rest of this with Latin America following up. So it's growth market. And therefore we do need to have the, the, the uh, skills and the talent to manage that. And we say medical devices, not because it's just the things that we are familiar with, the surgical equip, um, uh, cautery machine, the X-ray, the CT, the MRI, the PET scanner, and the monitoring, but also the IT, the healthcare IT, the e-health, and the uh, um, electronic medical record interaction with devices is a growing field. Many of these trends sit at the intersection of healthcare and technology. And as you can see, those names that everybody familiar with, Amazon, Google, and Apple are all coming big time into the life sciences field. The field, in order to have a framework and standard of, of uh, behavior for the technology, uh, have a lot of guidelines, standards, and recommendation. In this slide in front, of, in front of you on the left-hand side, you see starting with the FDA uh, 21 Code of Federal Regulation CFR Part 820 is all about managing the technology. Then we have NC, ASTM, ISO, IEC, NFPA, National Fire Protection Association are all standards. And it's a big challenge for each one of us to stay up to date with that, let alone to be involved in actually contributing to the evolution of those standards. As it shows on the right-hand side, the little boy Johnny was saying to his mother as he cracked the uh, uh, piggy bank, trying to get to the coin there, that it's actually failed the stress test. And maybe that's one of the guidelines in one of those standards is stress test for little piggy bank that our kids are having at their house. So what is the scope and purpose of forensic engineering? Simply stated, the application of engineering principle and scientific methodology to investigate the causes of unintended outcome is the principle of forensic engineering field. Things that are in debate that require some type of expertise and wide knowledge to determine what just happened. Because what happened, if we didn't intend, it's not something that the patient deserve. And we want to make sure that only intended outcome, only good quality and safe care is being provided. The field is also not just uh, involve the failure of devices and accessory, but also look at intellectual property. In other words, if you have an infusion pump or let's say pulse oximeter with some patent protecting its idea, the intellectual property, there might be another product on the market with the same feature, which is taking parts of the patent, parts of the part of the knowledge, parts of the principle, and that's called infringement and making this patent invalid or valid. I've been involved in many intellectual property um, uh, debate where one company claimed that another company stole or took advantage of a patent that they have the right for and produce uh, devices and took away some of the revenues. And uh, those uh, uh, intellectual property infringement about pulse oximetry is one of the big key uh, cases that are known um, uh, uh, between uh, Massimo uh, and another uh, product years back. 
many of this uh, uh, finding by experts uh, may lead to litigation where the case or the debate can be settled. And then you as uh, clinical engineers or forensic engineers will need to be involved in giving opinion and educate the court, meaning the judge, the attorneys, and the jury as to how did you arrive at your opinion. Why do we perform this unintended outcome investigation? Why do we look in that? First of all, because we uh, hold the declaration of do no harm and patients that are in our facility may be under anesthesia, might be under drug, might be not sufficiently educated as to what we are um, providing them and they are unable to defend for themselves. So preventing those conditions uh, from happening again is number one. Mitigation is number two, meaning that we need to understand what is the risk level, provide the evidence and give the opportunity for the institution to decide the risk is acceptable, we can function with those conditions, or the risk is not contained and we need to do something to mitigate it. There is also ethical uh, commitment to the public that we are in charge of making sure that the device performance is patient ready, meaning it is safe, it's calibrated, and it will be functioning uh, at the time uh, that the patient will need it. And then there is the issue of compliance. There are rules, regulations, standard accreditation, and we need to make sure that the assets we are responsible for are in compliance with that. And finally, we want to determine the reasons so we can facilitate better design or as I have been involved with at time, uh, removal from the market of unsafe devices and provide an alternative. The component of investigation in a clinical setting is very unique. You have to look and understand the clinical process and the sequence of event that led to those unintended outcome, to the adverse event, to the accident. You need to be able to look at the total uh, adversity and detect what is the root cause and deploy engineering, validated engineering testing methodology to explain and simulate that you can create the same condition with the same outcome again. And finally, at times we need to offer an alternative if the device is not safe and cannot be corrected either by ins further instruction or design changes, then we need to be able to offer another solution, another technology to address the same patient needs. So now that we understand what the field is and what is the purpose, the question is uh, why clinical engineer in general is uh, qualified or not qualified? Who should conduct the investigation? So the investigation in general need to be conducted by an expert. This is a requirement to have a qualified investigator. If the individual is a person within the hospital in a way uh, investigating uh, its own or her or, or his own facility, then it's better to have some team working together like safety officer and make sure that the, the opinion that is provided is not biased and it is fair and complete. So who might be such a, an expert, you might ask? In the US is very simple. There is something called the Federal Rule of Evidence 702. The, um, the uh, reference is provided to you at the bottom of this slide. You can go ahead and read it. And a quotation from that saying basically that if a scientific, technical, or other special, special knowledge will assist the participant, the parties, to better understand the fact and will provide evidence to determine what actually happened, then a person like that can become a qualified witness, 
that is dependent on his or her knowledge, skill, expertise, training, or education, and can bring his testimony and opinion to make this outcome uh, reasons um, publicly available. The court specifically saying that the conditions are to be qualified is whether the theory or the technique that one used to test um, is a, a normal uh, engineering, in our case, principle, whether the theory and the technique has been subjected to peer review and to publication where you can say, here is when a study showed that it was used, whether there is a known rate of a potential error of such event in other cases, and you can show the databases or study that pointing to that. And finally, that the process you uh, uh, deploy is generally accepted engineering and scientific approach. The key issues and the gathering of the gathering of the evidence is figure out what happened, why did it happen, what do we need to do to prevent it from happening in our institution, and how can we distribute the knowledge so it will be prevented from happening elsewhere in the world. And the gathering of information is go through and first of all, examine the device, the scene, medical record, the maintenance, the national database for similar uh, failure, and then interview the participant, the physician, the nurses, and perhaps the pharmacist, and learn um, what uh, a listening technique you need to deploy before you start coming to conclusion. Do not jump to conclusion, but analyze the evidence. What were the administrative causes to the, uh, to the accident? Was it possible to prevent it? And was it possible to predict it? And you look at all the contributing factors and then you can go and identify the cause. The Institute of Medicine published report about 23 years ago, the reference again is the bottom of the slide, called to err is human. And they say that there are many errors in the delivery of healthcare. In this article, it was in North America. But at the same time, what we are lacking is creating a learning environment around it, not to hide it, not to cover it, not to play hush hush, nobody need to know, but on the contrary, have a mechanism of learning from failure, from error, and have a, a feedback process where the team is able to say, um, we understand what contributed to that. And from now on, it will be part of the safety, safety training to make sure that this will not happen again. I already mentioned a couple brand name and couple companies. And I just want to make a disclaimer that I point to areas product and a company just for educational purpose. I'm not pointing finger, finger. I'm not suggesting that they are a, a good, bad, or in between. I'm just trying to educate you to better understand the field of forensic engineering and the methodology. Here's an example of failure that the Food and Drug Administration has, be, has posted uh, not long time ago. And it says basically that you have a, a catheter called Zoom 71 reperfusion, and it's a, a being recalled because the tip of the catheter may be breaking while the surgeon or the physician try to pull it back. This distal tip is dangerous being left behind and can cause a tremendous um, a serious um, injuries. And it is therefore called class one recall. You can see that on the bottom of the screen. It's a most serious type of recall that can cause serious injury on death. And the reason I mention it because many more people familiar with 
the Food and Drug Administration classification of devices than of recall because class one device by the FDA is devices that have low risk and, 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 and easy to maintain its safety relative to class two and three. So we talked about having hazards in our life in everything that we do on this planet from walking down the sidewalk to skiing downhill to uh, uh, eat, eat um, uh, unhealthy food uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, what is the, this concept of hazards? And is it only in healthcare? No, it's all around, it's involved with everything that we do. And in aviation, for example, uh, we determine that we must learn about the hazards and avoid the risk of airplane crashing with passenger in them. And they really achieve tremendous improvement, improvement in their safety in aviation. And now the healthcare is trying to do the same. And then you ask, so what is the difference between hazard, hazard and risk? Well, hazard is something that has potential to harm you. And risk is the likelihood that that hazard is actually will cause harm. In simple world, if you are on the beach having a great time in, uh, in the Mediterranean, soaking in the sun during this middle winter, as they do in Italy, so Stefano is telling me, and, uh, and you look at the water and you see this famous triangle of the shark moving back and forth. As long as you're on the beach and not getting in, this is just a hazard the potential to harm you is almost none. But if you like challenges and you decide to go and swim with this triangle and maybe look at the shark teeth and maybe even touch it and take a photo, now you are having a risk and you are in a condition where you can have a serious outcome that is not healthy. So here's the hazard on the left-hand side, potential to cause harm. And the risk is combination of the probability that this hazard will have an impact, the size of this impact, the severity of this risk, and the possibility that we can discover this risk before it will happen so we can prevent it. Those three factors are consisting of the risk, which then can become a number. You can give a number to the probability, to the severity and discoverability, and that number can be presented as a sum total to your facility, and a decision can be made, is that risk acceptable, or you need to do something to contain it better. Safety, on the other hand, is subjective, is more of a general uh, description of a situation not quanti quanti quantifiable as the risk can be. Simply show you, you're probably all familiar with the likelihood of event taking place on the vertical left-hand side axis and the impact of such event on the horizontal uh, bar uh, on the top. And it can go from very unlikely and negligible impact, which is in this matrix, very low risk, green, you welcome to move ahead, provide the care and use the uh, equipment involved in, that, involved in that, all the way to the risk is likely, the impact is severe and highly uh, to take effect and you need to do something to prevent it. In addition, we said the third is the predictability or detectability of the risk is the third factor that we need to understand that like, for example, when you put heart monitor, connect to a patient, we have a monitor that give us an indication, heart rate is changing, alarm is sounding, we need to have a nurse intervening in the care and prevent it from having a poor outcome. 
the technology in our life in healthcare is a bit complex. There is commercially off the shelf product like smartphone that getting more and more involved in patient care. And there are regulated devices like medical devices where the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration have specific guidelines. The commercially off the shelf product are less control and have less regulation to uh, uh, subject to approval. And then in between all those, we have the software, the middleware and the services uh, that are controlled by different agencies. The Food and Drug Administration have specific medical device the regulation. I must say that the uh, medical device regulation, the MDR in Europe have similar approach to the control and regulation. And basically saying that when the primary mechanism of action is physical, not chemical, for example, vascular stent, that is the beginning definition of a medical product. It's intended to affect a structure and you can read the rest of the stuff on the slide. And when software is used to diagnostic purposes, therapeutic or rehabilitation, then it's become a medical device as well. In essence, it's all about the intended use. If you take a kitchen knife, it's just a kitchen knife and does not have many regulation to comply with. But the same knife in the operating room called surgical knife is now have a different intended use to cut tissue and therefore is more regulated. Technology has life cycles all the way from midnight. You can, um, you can see top 12 clock on this, on this clock where the concept is moving clockwise through prototyping, clinical manufacturing, man marketing, commercial use, and obsolescence, and the cycle start all over again. In each one of these, we have hazards, we have risk that we must contain, and we have the obligation to the public to see that we are doing no harm. FDA has specific mission that all the medical products are safe and effective, and the public is protected. And regarding the regulation, the Food and Drug Administration have more than just medical devices. It's also regulate food, drug, cosmetic, veterinary um, uh, product and drugs, as well as uh, smoking material such as tobacco and vaping. So it's not just the medical devices that it's controlling. And as we said before, the Food and Drug Administration is using the um, methodology of assigning risk to product and based on the increased risk, there are more regulation where class one is low risk, class three is the highest risk. During the pandemic era, we start seeing, become familiar more with emergency use authorizations, EUA, where the FDA allow for expedited approach to give market clearance to product because of the immediate need and immediate sharp increase in patient requirement and not sufficient enough of inventory av available. There are two routes for product to get to the market, one through what's called the 510K. This is clearing where the FDA, the FDA is completely dependent on the manufacturers to provide all the safety data. And the other one is through the PMA, pre-market approval process, where it's providing the approve rather than the clearance. There is the famous waterfall process of how device should be designed and how we, the manufacturers, must control the process, knowing the risk and find out how well it's controlled. And if it's not mitigated completely, did we communicate that to the user through the instructions for use? Unfortunately, um, beginning in July 2011, we already start seeing a report from the scientific and the medical community suggesting that this approach is not properly um, implemented 
because there are too many uh, medical device error and failure in the field. This including the uh, things that you see on the slide before you, give credit to Isabella Gieras uh, from California, a colleague of mine who is directing a very nice uh, clinical engineering prog program in her hospital. Here in Texas, we have a, a, a mistake that took place in the intensive care unit when a milk that was pumped from the mother and put in a barcoded bottle in a refrigerator to feed her baby was accidentally given, given to another baby. You can appreciate the family reaction and the risk might, might, may or might not be as large, but uh, we need to be able to prevent this type of errors. The World Health Organization has tremendous interest in patient safety globally and actually have a mini series where they are giving the recent report. Uh, just in December, they released their report to suggest that the guideline that the WHO is providing to assure safety uh, to patients is still pertinent and we need to follow it because as many as one in four patients are harmed while receiving primary or ambulatory health care around the world. It's estimated that between 8 and 12 percent of the patient admitted to the hospital experience adverse event while receiving care. Uh, we all agree that this is a, a high a percentage should be able to reach much better, much safer environment. And in addition, the cost is tremendously high because of what happened in a patient not able to continue to have quality life, come back to work, etc. The rules, therefore, are looking at the people that are making, using, and applying the, uh, the technology, the structure, how this application taking place, and did the technology was supported by sufficient indicator to make sure that both use and design are appropriate. And as you can see here, there are over 600,000 medical device report per year, according to the FDA, where less than half of them are recalled because of design problem. The Global Clinical Engineering Alliance was involved recently with the uh, investigation of the quality and safety of new innovation that are intended to provide innovative solution in low uh, resource and middle income countries to fight COVID-19. We use part of our analysis and determination that describe in this document with this methodology that I've described to you today. This is not something new. Uh, the phenomena of requiring understanding of methodology and application of tools to contain the minimum amount of adverse event have been published in the New England Journal of Medicine, as well as the British Medical Journal, uh, all the way back to 1991. And in recent publication by the Kaiser Health uh, News from Kaiser Permanente, their point was that uh, uh, the thousand click of the electronic medical record is also not providing safe environment. If you look over the trend, of medical device uh, failure report, you can see that the trend is not in the direction that we would like to see. It has increased significantly in the last uh, uh, 20 years, uh, more specifically in the last uh, seven, eight years, it even got to the point where we're all concerned about that. Those malfunctions reported that uh, fixed uh, that the uh, injury uh, event involved almost one third of them and death caused by about 
of those reported databases. So the question that I have for you is, if you have a near miss, which as described here, the outcome for the patient really was not risky, meaning that if a nurse catches a medication mistake at the bedside before it reached the patient, what does it tell you about the hospital's effort to prevent the medical, the medication error? What does it, this near miss incident is telling you? And the answer can be one, well, the system is working. We caught it before it happened. Two, well, the system is not working because still unsafe conditions were brought about. And third, it might be combination of both of them. So near miss reporting, therefore, is one of the weak link in database buildup of teaching the healthcare delivery team lessons of how to do it safer. Because the feeling in general is that catching an event before it cause a harm, this near miss is not reported usually. And if near miss is a sign the system is working because we don't have enough information that it does not, then there's no invest, invest in incentive to question the process and learn from it. So therefore we would say in the question of is near miss is reported event, we should say yes, because we need to learn how not to allow this condition from happening. So we understand the field, we understand what investigations are, the methodology, who is qualified to perform the investigation, what are the component? And then finally, the question is, what should we investigate in, and should we include near misses? As in, you can see, all the incident uh, causes that are on the left-hand side uh, should be included. And even though those two trucks have a fancy brand name of Mer Mercedes-Benz logo in the front, there is a point where when you load it too much, it will tip over and maybe this high, uh, this guy that is uh, looking to uh, uh, ride on the left-hand side of the picture gonna just make the straw that broke the camel back. In learning about case studies, as Tony Isti in uh, Toronto taught us, there is issue relating to human factor engineering and Patricia uh, is continue in the same institution with the methodology of telling us who beside the user may be, contrib may be contributing to the risk. Is the manufacturer or the designer is the only one? Is the salesman who sold it? Is the service technician who repaired or maintained it? Is the facility who treated the assets uh, not appropriately? Or is the staff member that clean it or connected it to the patient? Or as I saw in some of the cases, the patient himself. All this part of human factor engineering that we need to understand and apply as well. So as we come to the closure of my presentation, I hope that you find the field to be intriguing, interesting that you believe that we have an area that require engineering attention and require qualification to be able to practice in it. The, the um, list of the um, uh, subject on the right-hand side are all investigation that I was personally involved with and performed the investigation and the methodology in the way that I described to you in this presentation. I don't believe that in this presentation, we have time left to go through those, but hopefully I will be invited to come back and giving you some specific example from those case studies. So in conclusion, organization are react swiftly and positively to incident because they want to affirm their commitment 
to the mission of delivering safe and well being care to all their patients and their employees. Forensic engineers, as the point was made, is a competent professional who is experienced in the technology, its standard guidelines, rules, and understand how such technology can be used in a clinical environment and what are the extent of the risk involved in that. This individual, this expert, this professional is able to conduct in, in non-biased and ethical fashion the incident investigation protocol to find the fact and the evidence without blaming, find the cause of the incident and complete an investigation report that shows that this can be duplicated, simulated, and the evidence is there to say, this is the reasons, and here are the recommended resolution from preventing that from happening here in this institution or someplace else. Knowing that your expertise as forensic engineer contributed to the improvement in patient safety when technology is deployed is priceless. And here lies the answer, is it worth it? Of course it does, and it's needed. Thank you for being patient, and I'm looking forward to see the recording of this presentation on the Global Clinical Engineering Alliance website soon.